special featured guests this year will be Ford Racing Technology Engineer, Mose Nolan. The story of Ford's foray into international competition in the 60s resonates to this day as the sheer force of Henry Ford II's will and significant corporate funds pushed Ford and its racing GT40s to greatness at the 24 Hours of Le Mans and in races around the world. This year's event will also showcase some 400 vintage race car entries from around the country. But this year we're going to be highlighting just the GT40s. So what do you say, let's get started. And first up, located in the lower paddock area, was the Ford Racing Performance Pavilion, showcasing some of their performance products. Also on display was a number of accomplished Ford road racing cars from the Roush Museum. company called Superformance, which builds quality recreations of the GT40, are also here in full force, showing not only their line of GT40s, but the recreations of the Cobra and the Cobra Daytona Coupe. And located in the upper paddock area was the Ford GT40 Pavilion. This is where most of the original GT40s were kept, which was adorned out front by Ford's new supercar, the Ford GT. And now, one of the world's greatest race cars, the Ford GT40. There were Mark 1s, there were the 427 Mark 2s, there were the Mark 3 streetcars, and the Mark 4s. Wow! Ford remains the only U.S. manufacturer to win the world's most prestigious road race, having won the 24 Hours of Le Mans four straight years in 66, 67, 68, and 69. The yellow number one car is a Mark IV, chassis J4. It's the winner of the 1967 12 Hours of Sebring race. And this Mark II won Le Mans in 1966. This Mark IV chassis J6 won Le Mans in 1967. And this Mark II chassis 1015 won the 1966 24 Hours of Daytona and finished second that same year at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. This Mark IV, now owned by the Henry Ford Museum, was driven to victory by Dan Gurney and A.J. Foyt in the 67 Le Mans race. It finished 32 miles ahead of the second place car. Notice the bubble on the roof, which was added to accommodate Dan Gurney's height in the car. The Mark IIs and the Mark IVs had 427 cubic inch engines and a special T44 transaxle in them. The Mark I's, II's, and III's were officially called Ford GTs, but later given the name GT40 because of its overhaul height of just 40 inches. The Mark IVs were officially called GTP cars for Grand Touring Prototypes, 
But because of its design to comply with FIA Appendix J regulation, it was later named the J car. The Mark 1s, 2s, and 3s chassis were constructed of steel, whereas the Mark 4s were of a honeycomb sandwich aluminum material. The Mark 1s, 2s, and 3s chassis were built in England by Ford Advanced Vehicle, but the Mark 4s were all American, built in Dearborn, Michigan by a Ford owned subsidiary called Carcraft. up with an ex-GT40 driver, Bob Bondurant. What do you think of this uh, Ford celebration here the GT40? Oh, I think it's great. I remember driving a Ford GT40 at Le Mans in 65. We ran 212 down the mall, so on a straight way back there. They're a fantastic car. And actually, they're really a pretty good, easy car to drive quick. Uh, handles well, brakes are fantastic, everything. These cars are just flat, beautiful. Nice to see them all today. Will you be picking one out today? Um, someone asked me uh, that maybe I could drive the one out front, the Lamar car. So uh, I'd like to. We'll see what happens. Don't want to drive it in the wet, though. <laughs> Man, what an impressive collection of original cars. But now, let's go out and check out some of the cars located in the paddock area. Hello, I'm Lee Holman with Holman & Moody. I'm here at um, Road America with a GT40 Mark II that we built in 1992. It's exactly like we raced in 1966 at Le Mans. It's actually set up the way Mark Donahue preferred his car. And just having a good time at Elkhart Lake. Pearls on the hill at turn 7. Plymouth Arlington's by the Toyota Bridge. The Elkhart Lake lines have turned to Souvenir Road. And the GT40 Ford display. All the way this is Chris McAllister's Mark III chassis 1051, which he has upgraded to the vintage racing modifications with the Gurney Westlake cylinder heads and a roll cage. It's currently configured in the 1969 John Wire Automotive Engineering Golf Team car specifications. In this car, we'll participate in Sunday's big race. And many Superformance GT40 owners with their cars are here this weekend to participate in this special event. And this is Dennis Olfoss's Superformance replica of a Mark II 427 cubic inch GT40. And you'll also see this car in Sunday's race. Hi, my name's Martin Goff, and I'm part of a company called GT Transmissions Limited from England. Three guys got together about two years ago, and we wanted to make a gearbox or a transmission for GT40 replicas and mid-engine sports cars to replace the old ZF, which is now 40 years old. We approached a company called Quaif Engineering in England and we sat down around the table for a meeting of about three or four hours to bash out the, the prototype and six months later we had a transmission sat on the bench ready to go in a car. Two months later the testing was finished and we went into production and we've produced a transaxle which will take 600 brake horsepower, 550 foot pounds of torque and will fit any V8. We do a Bell housing also to fit the Chevy and the uh, Ford bolt pattern. We do the clutch cross shaft and clutch, we can also do for you clutch slave cylinder. And Dennis Altoff has just raced at the uh, Elkhart Lake races and finished third in class overall. And we think he's done a wonderful job. The transmission's a five speed, it's all synchromesh and it's the original.
original H pattern, as in the cars that were raced in the 60s at Le Mans and circuits all over the US. And we think we've done a wonderful job to bring the product to market, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the tape. Thank you. Well, it's Saturday, and the GT40s and Recreations owners are getting their cars ready to take to the track for a couple of easy parade laps in honor of the car and its racing heritage. the cars move out. are now lining up in their pre-grid positions. Then they're given the okay to take to the track. driver and one of the events hosts, Brian Redman. It was great. Yeah, really nice. Yeah, it's ready to race. How was it for you when you were drove those things? Were they really nice? To yes, they were really nice, no, but not just, you know, they were, you always felt secure in them. They were strong, very strong chassis. And so even on the very fast tracks like Spa, Frankishom in Belgium and Monza and uh, Le Mans, you never felt a danger as you did in some other cars, you know, so which shall be nameless, but the GT40 was a great car. Brian Redman now opens the door for ex GT40 driver and announcer David Hobbs. Get it above it. First. Okay. 
I couldn't get out of third gear. I couldn't get it into four. Really? No. I try it all the time, so I'm going up here all the time in third. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you have these two? Six? And now it's time for our special guest, a living legend at Ford Racing, Ford Race Engineer, Mose Nolan. Right now, Mose is being interviewed on his racing history by the track radio station. Um, I believe I participated in three uh, Baja 1000s and uh, Parker 400s and a few other uh, uh, Las Vegas races. And here he's talking about his days with the race team at Le Mans. And in his spare time, Mose is involved in the restoration of an original GT40 Mark IIA for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. And now, Mose Nolan. In 1966, when Mr. Ford decided that we were headed for Le Mans for the great Grand Prix of the 24-hour Le Mans, uh, activity really started uh, a year and a half before. The chassis work started in England and engine work started right in the Tripoli e building here in, in Dearborn in, in the product development group. And, and eventually uh, the engine and the vehicle had to come together and that all happened here in the United States. Uh, some of the cars, uh, chassis were shipped to uh, Shelby, some of them to, to the home in Moody activity and the engines come out of Dearborn dynamometer fully tested and rated and were sent in down south into the west coast to go into cars. Um, I become involved with uh, the engine program in its early days assembling the engines to uh, be tested at dynamometer so there was a lot of work, uh, a lot of overtime uh, trying to make our dates for uh, get the engines uh, to dynamometer and then get them out of dynamometer to the cars. Um, when the engines were sent uh, to the chassis installers, uh, there was little, uh, little defects uh, notice on the engine that wasn't uh, really raceable, and a couple of us were dispatched uh, south and, and west to, to fix these uh, engines. And this all took place just in the closing moments of, of prepping the cars and uh, testing them out on, on, on the airport uh, service roads. Uh, John Homan used the Charlotte Airport to shake down uh, his GT40 fleet and Carol Shelby used the service roads of uh, the LA Airport uh, for his uh, shakedown roads. But then the cars were loaded on planes and, and shipped to uh, Le Mans, uh, actually to Paris and then trucked down to Le Mans and they had made advanced preparation uh, for a facility to work out of because uh, there was bound to be a tremendous a lot of, amount of work to be done during practice periods and keeping the cars maintained and, and competitive. This car that Mose is working on with other volunteers is an ex Mark Donahue car, chassis 1032. It's a Mark IIA with a 427 cubic inch engine. Mose is an engine man and he worked on this car and others during that period of time. I think that's the safe. I'm clear. The car finished second at the 1966 12 Hours of Sebring race with Mark Donahue and Walt Hanskin driving the car. Then the car went to Le Mans that same year, this time with Mark Donahue and Paul Hawkins driving. In 1967, Ford donated the Holman and Moody prepared car to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum, where it had sat for over 40 years unrestored. That's it. Done by done. It was a wonderful experience, and I personally feel that it was an opportunity that uh, a lot of people would like to have jumped into, but I was uh, blessed and in the right place at the right time. and. And, and had the distinction of, of working on those wonderful cars and, it's, and it gives me great pleasure to be uh, associated with one today. What an experience it must be to work on a car you worked on some 45 years ago. How was, how was, your, how was Ford's reception when you arrived? We were re receptive 
very well, and, and, and we prepared for that because out of the seven cars that we were taking to France, uh, we gave one of them to Ford of France as a factory-backed effort for them to campaign. So, you know, that, that's kind of like buying your way in. You throw something <laughs> in the front door before you get there. But We've been talking to Mose Nolan of uh, Ford Racing and uh, a man who has seen the development of Ford from practically the very beginning in racing and right up uh, to the present. It's been uh, a real pleasure having you here, Mr. Nolan, and uh, we appreciate you, you and Ford for taking the time to support this weekend. It makes it special. Thank you so very much. On Saturday and Sunday, located inside the Ford GT40 Pavilion, Ford hosted an autograph session with some of their distinguished guests. Hey, I'll tell you what, it's been fun. There's been a lot of great people come by here. Yeah, it's been uh, it's supposed to be a half hour deal. We're about into 55 minutes right now. So it's been, there's been a lot of them. It's been great. I never even noticed the cold. <laughs> It's going great. We're going down here and look at a, a Mike Teske's car. Oh, great. Yeah. Here, Mike Teske, the man on the right holding the book, and his group are in the process of building a limited number of continuation or replica Mark IV cars. And they're here this weekend displaying their first prototype chassis. When the parts are used up, that's it. And that letter came last week. And it really seems strange now that Ford's out there saying And apparently Bob Bondurant was impressed. Wow. That's when yeah. um, when uh, John Wire was yeah, John was there and Bill uh, and um, Shelby. Uh, yeah. Before it was just a job for me, and I never thought that, that they would ever become an icon and stay on. You know, it's so nice. This well, keeps uh, me going. Yeah. You know? oh, yeah. Well, it's now Sunday, race day. The drivers are in their cars and getting ready to head out to the pre-grid just before the race. Then they start to head out to the pre-grid area.
cameras in two different cars. Two cameras in this car of Chris McAllister's and one in Dennis Olthoff's car. And then the cars are released onto the track. has been given the honor to flag the start of the race. There will be many different types of cars in this race, but we're going to concentrate on just the GT40s. The cars are taking their ceremonial parade lap before the start. Cars are now coming around the last turn before they come up the hill for the start. The pace car pulls off. As they come up the hill, the drivers are watching for Mose to throw the green flag. And there it is! They're off! are a little strung out, but that's expected in a vintage car race. So now let's ride with Dennis Olfa. Let's ride with Chris McAllister. Now remember, it's four miles around for one lap here at Road America.
Dennis dives down in the hurry downs. He makes a small mistake, which Alola takes advantage of. Dennis, concentrating on the car ahead, forgets about the car that's behind him. of the race and Dennis is closed in on the Lee Holman car. flags come out. pack up. We hope you enjoyed it half as much as we did. So now, from all of us at Vintage Videos, oh, it's just me. Well, take care and so long until next race. Kiss me